So I've just we'll just be starting very soon. It's 8.35. I've just had a, a message to say we've already got um, nearly 50 people tuned in. So that's fantastic. So I think now I'm going to start. My name is Alison Strauss and I'd like to welcome everybody to the Hippodrome Silent Film Festival online edition and our first live event on our opening night. I hope that you've all, everybody here has just come fresh from uh, watching Body and Soul with Wycliffe's wonderful, wonderful score. Um, I'm just going to explain a little bit of housekeeping about how this is gonna work. We've got 45 minutes and um, this is going to be recorded. And there is an opportunity for anybody who's tuning in to ask questions in the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. Um, there is a raise hand function, but everybody's camera's turned off, I'm afraid. So we won't be able to um, see that. But as I say, pop your question into the Q&A box. Um, I'm delighted that we have a BSL interpreter as well as live captioning happening. So if you need the captions, just click on the um, CC icon at the bottom of your screen and you can adjust those to as you how you need. Um, so, but now I'd just like to start with the introductions. So I'm absolutely thrilled and honored to welcome Wycliffe Gordon here. And as we were chatting about this earlier, basically Wycliffe is a really big deal. He's, um, he's been awarded trombonist of the year 13 years in a, a, a 13 times by the Jazz Journalists Association. Um, he's got such a long roster of achievements and contributions to uh, music, he presents much masterclasses, clinics, workshops, children's concerts, he lectures to students. Um, but one of the favorite things that jumped out at me is uh, since 2007, there's even a Wycliffe Gordon Day, <laughs> which is really cool. And uh, that's the 17th of August. Um, and it's in the city of Augusta declared by proclamation of the mayor. So welcome to you Wycliffe. And Thanks. <laughs> and I'd like to welcome Professor Charles Musser. And um, Charles is a professor of film and media studies at Yale University. And he's an author and he's a filmmaker. And he's actually he co-curated um, the uh, five DVD set of the Pioneers of African um, American Cinema, which uh, won an award, didn't it, Charles? Uh, the Film Heritage Award, uh, which is, Fantastic. And basically, um, he's really helped expand our understanding of, of early cinema and its, its place in American culture. And we're really thrilled that Charles is here to have, have this conversation with us uh, today. Um, I've got a few questions for uh, Charles and for Wycliffe, and I'm going to kick off with those. But um, I'm also, as I say, I'm going to refer to the questions in the box as we go. So uh, Wycliffe, I just wanted to start by saying thank you so much for your score. And it, you seemed so very much in tune with the film. And I, I'd wondered actually when you, um, were you already used to watching a lot of silent film? Um, and how, what was your response when you first encountered Body and Soul? Well, um, thank you for having me the answer to your f first question is no um you know with a lot being relative i i grew up in a house with um silent home films being made my father had a uh, eight millimeter and it, it was both i mean we had sound films but he he shared with us some films like movies when we were kids like you know Godzilla, Abbott and Costello, <laughs> they were all silent. And um, <clears throat> and as an adult, um, I was first introduced to um, not silent film, but the opportunity to work with silent film back in, I was approached in 1998. Um, or yeah, 98 or 99, the New York Film Society was going to, they're going to celebrate the centennial of the birth of Paul Robeson. And so in August of 2000, that was the premiere of uh, Body and Soul. I had not had a lot of experience with silent films, but I always wanted to write for film. And 
being in the music industry, you could, um, it's kind of clear to see that there's a niche, uh, there's a place for that, whether it's in LA, New York, or if you're kind of connected, so to speak. But um, this was an opportunity for me. I, be, I was allowed to be, I had total autonomy in writing the music for the film. It wasn't two minutes here, this type of music. And once I watched the film, it was, I said, great. It's, uh, it was set in my home state of Georgia. And, 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 and a lot of the material, I had become familiar with the, the, the visual I could hear the sound of the the folks in church. I could hear the sound of the the scenes that would take place in the home, you know, with the daughter and the mother, or the daughter, uh, the mother and her two friends. And I later became familiar with the scenes or the sounds um, associated with the, the the bar scenes, you know, as I'd become an an adult. <laughs> and um, so. And that was pretty much it, but I I was excited to do this when I was approached by mm -hmm. Jazz at Lincoln Center um, to to do this film. And, um, and outside of uh, just knowing very little about silent films, I learned a lot with this project <laughs> because I began to read about Oscar Me Show and, um, and, and, and again, that was my introduction, my, my first one. And it really, uh, it really comes across how much you connected with the film and how much you, you understood it. I think with your music, I'm just gonna ask Charles um, to uh, maybe a quick question to set the scene for us, uh, for the audience, uh, uh, to sort of put in context this film when it came out. If you could tell us about maybe um, Black American movie going in in 1925. Um, and maybe explain what about race films, what that means, and maybe yeah, just about about the context for when the film came out. Yeah, um, well, the United States uh, in the North, as much as the South, was uh, particularly when it came to movie going, uh, very uh, quite segregated, uh, and so you would have movie theaters say in Harlem and there would be like five seven of them whatever that that catered specifically to uh, African-American audiences um, and this was true all over the United States um, so you had uh, a you know I think there were like 10 percent of, of, of movie theaters overall let's say and so these film these theaters showed a lot of if you will Hollywood films but they also showed uh, what what were called race films, uh, and these were films that featured African American performers. Um, sometimes they were made, uh, produced, directed by African American filmmakers like Oscar Micheaux, uh, and sometimes they were uh, directed, but they, they they were white directors. But uh, whatever the circumstances, actually, they involved a kind of collaboration and a kind of integration. You know, these you couldn't make these films in a certain way uh, with without a kind of uh, Black-white collaboration. Now, I don't mean to say that you know it was always this the same level of collaboration. And, and I think what's interesting is so these films were designed for black theaters, but it, it's interesting that some of these theaters that you you would see a report on them and they'd say, yes, you know, seventy-five percent of the people in this theater were African American, but that meant another twenty-five percent were not. Uh, and I and so I always think that it's uh, important to understand the the extent to which. Uh, 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 Jim Crow laws were, were in certain circumstances sort of in, imperfect, were being undermined or being challenged. Uh, and likewise, these race films uh, got, got to Europe. Um, so of the three Oscar Michaud films that survived, one was found in the Belgian film archive and another in a Spanish film archive. So, you know, Europe was another... Um, Another uh, a source of, uh, of sales and, and, and income for Austin and Joe. Uh, so his films were shown uh, in, in Europe. Uh, you know, it's hard to track exactly where and how, but they were definitely here because uh -huh. they had Spanish intertitles in, in, on one hand and French and Flemish intertitles on the other. That's really interesting, Charles. And it's clear that you are 
an expert basically in Oscar Misha. You've seen a lot of his films. Well, you've seen the three silent films that are extant and you've studied him and you, you've heard lots of interpretations, uh, musical interpretations of um, his work. But you said something really interesting. You said earlier that you felt that uh, why could Gordon's score um, was a Misha yeah. score? And could you explain to us more about what you meant by that? Yeah, no, it was uh, such a delight to, uh, to to hear the score. Of course, you have to understand that uh, in these movie theaters, as well as on DVDs, is there's each, each movie theater would have a different orchestra playing a playing its own uh, or or band playing its own own score. So there were, these things were never standardized. And likewise, you know, Body and Soul does appear in a number of DVDs, and they have different scores. And I was I confess because I was associated with the Kino version, I had not heard this one so much, but this was this one was brilliant, and, and immediately uh, I I warmed to it because Wycliffe uh, brings out Black Carl uh, in in right at the beginning, and it seems to me that Black Carl is really the key key to this film. Uh, although I also want to say it's sort of ironic that this film was shown at uh, at a Paul Robeson centennial uh, celebration because Paul Robeson refused to acknowledge. His involvement with this film. In fact, I had repeated discussions with his son, Paul Robeson Jr., who refused to acknowledge that his father appeared in this film. And, you know, I, I mean, of course, you could argue that it's actually Paul Robeson's uh, outstanding motion picture performance. Um, now, why is that? It's because Oscar Michaud was, um, uh, this, this, this film was, was actually attacking Paul Robeson's involvement with a series of plays about the Negro Soul by white playwrights. And he just felt he was, uh, you know, he was actually over in England uh, uh, when, this, when this film was first shown in, in Harlem. And he was going around telling everyone, uh, he, was, he was performing in Emperor Jones by Eugene O'Neill. And he was telling everyone that Eugene O'Neill really understood the Negro Soul. And that's what really infuriated Oscar Micheaux, right? That he, that he was, if you will, fronting for all these white playwrights and, and sort of, providing a kind of cover or, 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 or promotion for them. And, uh, and, and so, I, so the film is an elaborate critique of exactly that. It's, it's a kind of critique of those, of those plays uh, as well, and, and therefore of Robeson. And Robeson was sort of you know, uh, lured into doing this without quite realizing what he was getting involved in. Um, but you know, if people want to pursue this, uh, Further, they could look at the now restored version of Emperor Jones, the 1933 version, um, and uh, and see some of the parallels in his performance between Body and Soul and and, and Emperor Jones. Yeah. So anyway, so 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 Black Carl is is the detective. He's actually sort of the 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 uh, the, the the conscience of Black performance at this moment. That's that's how he's described in a few newspapers and he, he comes he was down based on a, it's a there is a real person that's important to say isn't it there was a real, real person called black carl he wasn't a detective he was an actor <laughs> he went down to he went down to arrest paul robeson for 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 this behavior of his for his you know for his alliance with not only his alliance with eugene o'neill but the way in which he was you know if you will uncle tommy uh, for him um, I just uh, want to. The, 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 the score establishes that right at the beginning. I love it. Yeah, um, exactly. The, the score. I mean, I just want to. This isn't a question exactly. This is a comment in the box from uh, somebody saying, um, "Hearing it with this score was a total revelation." Thank you, Mr. Gordon, and that's from Annette Davison. And I think we all felt that really. Um, and so, yeah, so Wycliffe, you, you decided to start with that Black Carl straight at the beginning and to sing it out. Is that because you, um, you, what was it, you, you wondered to your, what Black Carl was about, why, why he was mentioned and then <laughs> never appears? Well, yes, after I watched the film three or four times, I said, it, it, in the very beginning of the film, um, it said noted detective Black Carl, and you, as you go through the film, I said I, I never got the opportunity to see Black Carl, but I was like, 
in the in the uh, caption, of course, because it was a silent film, it's like I wanted to create the suspense, like do 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 do, and it's like Black Carl is on is on your trail, and of course, after seeing the film three or four times, I realized that Black Carl appeared in name only, but and you know, just like um, Prof. Muscle just said. He's the, the 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 conscience, and as I got into the film more, it was just you know amazing how uh, Michelle um, depicted that with the use of the cinematography, having Paul Robeson to play two characters in 1925, and yeah. I was just like, so certainly he. I mean, I read a lot of the history about how he had to make his films and and you know he didn't have the backing of what would have been hollywood at that time but you know to 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 create such a thought provoking work um for me it was it was it was just a fun project to do and i have to admit that when i took it on i heard a couple of the other scores my relationship with silent films there's an organ soloist playing with the silent film or you see charlie <laughs> chaplin you hear the piano and i wanted to pay homage to that too and then mainly in the bar scenes but black call whenever i played that for friends of mine you know that would come and see a when we would um perform the film i have i have a good buddy named carl you know <laughs> he's a good, he's he, he's an fbi detective and I we used, to, we used to have a jokes like Black Carl, but you never you you never see him. He's always there, but you but you never see him. And I was like, but yes. So. Uh -huh. Well, I I think you mentioned about how the um, your it's your hometown Georgia and how it's it's from your familiar the scenes are familiar from your growing up. So maybe you could talk to us a bit about how you um, use those themes around the the bar, as you say, and the, the church and the, the home settings? Well, I, um, ideal for me, I wish I could have had, I wanted to have an orchestra and a choir, but <laughs> budget only allowed for a big band. So what I got the guys <laughs> in the band to sing, I got them to, um, and you know, we had, had many choices of instruments, but for me in the movie, there were uh, three main scenes. I mean, you know, had, there were other scenes that were shot and taken place outside, but the themes, um, like the slow theme when the daughter's talking to the mother, and then you always heard, do, 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 that was, I guess I, now that I think about it, that, that that's that black Carl on the scene. Whenever you saw Paul Robeson and the shady preacher, um, you know, minister character, um, and then um, I wanted to I wanted the themes to repeat as the thematic material developed on the um, film. And and um, again, there was the church the church scene. So I used that sound that I heard growing up. Um, in church, and it was my home, not necessarily hometown, but the home state of Georgia, and then it took place out in the rural area, and um, when the girl had to run away from home to go to Atlanta, that's the first time you see something kind of modern on the screen, so I took a jazz theme from a modern um jazz idiom you know bebop and played over the changes to either what was considered miles davis's so what or the court changes to john coltrane's impressions but it was like kind of fast and up tempo so i wanted to be on pace with the film and writing and composing the music or putting using music that i would composed before was not the most difficult thing it was dealing with the actual putting it with the putting the time code on because it didn't come to me chronologically from the film from zero 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 to to the end i said this scene is this and then when i got with the person that would burn the time code and then put the click track on he said no you have to do it we when we put the click track on it had to be from the beginning to end and it just completely 
turn things around for me. So I knew what I wanted to sound like, but now I had to put the puzzle together. And um, could you explain and, to people what a click track is? Not everyone will. Uh, well, a, cl a click track was what I was using. Sometimes folks play with a silent film and they can just watch. When you're doing that by yourself, you control the pace, the timing of the music. When you have 18 or 20 members in the band, there needs to be something that can keep us together. And even though orchestras, the, they'll follow the conductor. He's following the film, but I want it everything that I'd written to hit with the scene. So unlike a jazz concert, if someone takes another chorus, it'll be cool. With the film, it wouldn't work out that way. So I had a click in my ear with the tempo like, doom, so I had 75 minutes of click. So by the time <laughs> we got to that last, I could take my headphones off because the tempo was going to stay the same and it was clear it was the end of the film and i don't know if anyone caught it but the jazz standard body and soul i just put a little quote and like when um the daughter sat down to play the piano i had the piano play just go do 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 just those first few bars and then ba -da 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 -da. and it ended happy but it was very close to the end, but um, anyway, no, so I, I had fun with that. And it's interesting that you, you might have liked to use a choir and there's actually a comment in a question in the chat as well about how you, they this person, Annette says, um, so few silent film scores use voice here, it works so well. Um, and she says, did you think you'd include it from the start? And I wanted to bring both Charles and Wycliffe in on this, really around this use of voice. I'm interested in what, this idea of call and response and if there were any cultural differences when people were watching the film, whether people were calling out to the characters and, and Wycliffe, how you use the, the sort of the church gospel singing mm -hmm. thing. <laughs> so maybe from both, I'd like to hear from both of you on that question. Well, Proud Master, you want to go first or? Go ahead. Well, um, for me, it was all about relationships and connecting. Um, and so the call and response that had taken place in the band, there were several. When you get to the train station and you see um, when, when Paul Robeson's character meets the guy that he went to prison with, and they're talking, they bump into each other. And so I wanted to rather than using words or sounds, I wanted to use another thing that was kind of developed in the South. And you don't see it unless you're at the live performance, but it's a rhythm that goes like So they're chatting back and forth. And that conversation or call and response had taken place between all the band members doing what's known as a hand. Some people say hand bone or ham bone. And and Herlin Riley, who's playing drums at the time, it's like they're going back and forth. It's like, it wasn't like an argument was pursuing, but he said, hey, that guy has cleaned me out at the club. And he knew that, you know, you got to help me out. You got, you have to get me some money. I'm, I'm going to let people know who you are. So rather than saying, speaking or singing, I made that call and response to be a rhythmic call and response musically between us playing, the, you know, that rhythm. You can't see it because my camera's up. And then the drums. So, and that was a very, I thought it was a very important part of the film because we don't have, other than the, the, the lyrics, the words that were imprinted into the film, all you had was silence. So I wanted to get as close to creating those relationships musically with the voice and with instruments with and without the voice very successful and charles can you tell us a bit about this issue this yeah i mean you know these films were shown in 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 uh you know very under very often under very modest circumstances with a band and and with a, a boisterous uh, audience that that was uh itself quite active uh was not you know passive and and with this film in particular 
uh, I know, I mean, I've been in situations where uh, the predominantly uh, African-American audience where they start telling uh, Mary Jane to wake up, you know, uh, <laughs> and, and, and uh, you know, and I, I think the film is constructed that way uh, to, to really elicit uh, a response from the audience because in fact, that's what Oscar Michaud wants both Paul Robeson to do, but also the audience to wake up to the fact of what these uh, what these plays were doing, and 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 what and and also uh, obviously her uh, wake, waking up to uh, what what the uh, what, what the priest, what the minister, what the pastor is doing uh, in in uh, in terms of the exploitation. Um, so so it, so this is a film that really encourages a kind of uh, active verbal response from from the audience, and, and also uh, you know I'm sure that that it also came from. From, from the musical accompaniment as well. Um, so there could have been a quite complex uh, set of uh, responses to the film as it was being played, as it was being screened. It's, it, that's um, what you're saying there really ties, connects quite neatly with another question that's come into the chat about how it's really about audiences. It's from Georgina Coburn and she says, can you tell us about how the film was received on its release? Um, and if there's reviews of the time. But I think I'd also like to tease out that role of the audience, because I know, um, Wycliffe, you, you talked about when we spoke before informally about how the audience had, you, that you weren't sure if they were, how they would react to the It's All a Dream <laughs> reveal um, when you were performing live and whether you should play it for laughs and, and how you should go. But maybe talk about that. Yeah. Also talk about audience reaction then and now. Um, one thing before that, I used the tuba to kind of depict Paul Robertson's voice. You know, I, I was familiar with that doo 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 doo. Whenever he came up on the scene. Back to your immediate question. Um, I was only concerned about one thing, and there was a particular scene where it implied that a rape had taken place. As um, she was telling her, Sil uh, I'm saying Sylvia, I'm in another film. As the daughter was, was telling her story to her mother, you, you, this is what the pastor did. And in and, and this, you kind of really into the film now and you don't know it's a dream just yet. So what happens is she was explaining it to her mother before she then, she dies. It's like, you know, it was pretty, you know, gruesome, but I wrote something as a musical pun to, it was like a joke for guys, you know, and, and we showed that during a um, showing to the general public uh, to, you know, get some propaganda and not general public, I'm sorry, it was to the press. And, you know, there were some things going on in the association um, I was working with during the time, but it seemed like I played a ta-da. We hear that ta-da is like yay, you know, you're showing up. Ta-da is introduction. You come out, but my ta-da came after the 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 rape scene, the implied rape scene. Of course, you don't see it, but um, some women were offended, and that they felt like when they watched it for the first time that my statement was celebrating rape. And what it was was just a joke between guys. It's like, oh, did, did 20 minutes and it's like, we laughed about it. But we had to have a conversation and I actually took that out of my score. I, that's where I said, tacit, don't play that. And um, what was really eye-opening was I was concerned about that'll be the one thing they'll remember, Wycliffe, you know, I was concerned about that, but when I was conducting the band in front of both audiences the night that it opened, um, I, I I could look behind me and there were women laughing. There were, were men laughing, and I just I just I did like this. I said, "Well, it may have gone the other way," but so that was a a, a change because I'm always I always want to be and you know especially nowadays just conscious of statements or how people can interpret or perceive um, statements that are even made without words. So 
it's, that was, yeah. it's really you know, interesting how you respond to the audience even when you're not doing an improvised accompaniment that it's a it's a evolving evolving piece and charles can you tell us anything about how so about how people how it was received at the time maybe critics as well whether uh, right yeah i i mean it, it, there was a, a range of responses, um, but most of them were negative, particularly in the uh, Amsterdam News and uh, the New York Age. Uh, the New York, they, uh, they they started referring to Oscar Micheaux after this film as Oscar Mischiefo, Micheaux. They added like as in mischievous, right? And that that was how he was tagged for a long time. Uh, that he was, uh, you know, he was being mischievous. So. Um, the thing is that this this film was shot in 1924, right after Paul Robeson appeared in these three plays, but it wasn't released till 1925. And in that one year period, Paul Robeson really emerged as, and the Harlem Renaissance emerged with Paul Robeson as a central as a central figure. Um, and so people were not really, and critics who who might have understood a little bit what was going on in the film. Uh, we're not we're not amused. Uh, they they didn't uh, like Paul Robeson, who never acknowledged being in the film because he knew he was being put down. Uh, they 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 did not appreciate this film. And also, you know, the 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 year between when the plays were performed and when the film came out also meant that that um, that those plays were less in people's consciousness uh, than when it was shot. So I, I think that, uh, some of Paul Ro some of Oscar Micheaux's intention was. Not so self-evident, but he would. But it was it was uh, it was not a big success. Uh, it, it was a critically speaking, which I think is unfortunate, because you know I think it's a, a brilliant film. But this, you know, Oscar Micheaux was not necessarily a, making films for the uh, for the for the black elite. He was making them much more for you know for for or, ordinary working class. Uh, African American who would go to the movie theaters to have a good time, and um, and 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 so they, you know, so so there was a divided response. I think, you know, substantial sections of uh, of African American community, you know, lo loved his films, but the but the critics, by and large, were particularly after the the, the first few ones were were much more were much harder on him, um, which they later regretted. To some extent, they they later acknowledged that maybe they were unfair. Uh, but anyway, that's uh, so. He, Oscar Micheaux did not have an easy time of it. He it's not you would think that you know he would get a lot of support from the black press, but that wasn't necessarily the case. Mm. I was, I was, it's not really it's not an easy film to define or categorize, is it? And um, I really noticed with your score, Wycliffe, how you because it's it's got some very funny light moments, like, you know, the, the women with the really elaborate hats in the church. And then, you know, it's obviously got very dark moments as well. You know, and uh, that sequence when, um, is it Mar Martha Jane, when she comes home to find that she, the money's gone. And um, is, is it is blood money? Is that the, the sort of theme that yeah. you have? And it's really, really rents the emotion for how it, the impact of that, finding all her savings gone. And I just wondered about how you, yeah, just if you want to talk about balancing that or juggling that very difficult line of light and dark. Well, um, for me, it was difficult because I grew up here in the United States in a Southern African-American Baptist church and having to grow grow up being told that, you know, there's two kinds of music, secular and sacred. Um, but they didn't say it that way. Those were the uh, terms, but they said there's God's music and then everything else is Satan's music. And and I, I joke about this sometimes when I perform, but I say, wow, it was really difficult for me because I was like, well, if this is Satan's music, he has some pretty nice music. You know, anything that was jazz or anything that wasn't um, sacred, but with this film score, I said I can, I can, I can do both. I can play jazz and and, and I can um, utilize the sounds of gospel and even, um, you know, tragedy and triumph is what I what I saw and I said I can try to to um, create that musically, 
you know, uh, without words. So, yes, um, as I woke up early this morning, uh, it's a work song. So, and that's something that you may hear about on prison farms or slaves in the South or working on a farm in the South. They would sing songs like um, that in, in that style to make the workday go by quicker or it's just easier. And got started on my way. Uh, and we had fun, you know, singing it because it's just, you know, a bunch of guys. And... I had to work, 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 work all day just to earn this. And I called it blood money, I think, at that time. You, I worked my fingers down to the bone. Um, and, you know, I, I spilled my blood on the ground to make this, you know, this money so it's going. And I saw a movie later on with Blood Diamonds. But I just, you would hear people say, I put my blood, sweat, and tears into earning this, you know, my home, my, but now it's gone. So, and I was just like, when I'm um, doing that sequence, I said I wanted to capture, it's it's a work song, but it's like, it's, it's kind of, it's optimistic, but it's also kind of difficult and hard to deal with. It's like, oh, my whole life's, you know, my savings are gone and, you know, what happened. And so um, I had fun with that. And as you'll notice, I I sang, but I also employed some of the other guys to sing. It's, it's just a work song. And I, I allowed the band to be creative. And, th and this was what was good about the collaboration. The musicians really got into the film. And Herlin Riley, the drummer, he sang a verse. He said, uh low down Reverend Jenkins, uh, dirty Reverend Jenkins was a low down man. And then we do that call and response, was a low down man, always throwing a brick and trying to hide his head. So he tells you, he actually tells you what's coming up, but it was a, an improvisation. And I say, I like it. I left it in. Mm -hmm. So um, there were moments he, um, where if you, you you pay attention, you know you. But at that moment, you're watching what's going on the screen, and you're kind of feeling the music. So and and that's what he got from that. He said, "Man, low down, Reverend Jenkins, dirty Reverend Jenkins is a low down man, always throwing a brick and trying to hide his hand." And it was just like, I said, "That's perfect." Yeah. You know. I Perfect. So, I've got to say, there's a lot of love in the Q and A chat about the score, and um, everyone's saying wonderful, wonderful, um, and people are saying it blew me away. And um, I can't believe how quickly the time has gone for this chat. Um, but I, we are going to have to wind it up. But um, just, I suppose, very quickly, the one of the last questions that's been posed is is quite a fitting for a conclusion, which is about um, why, Cliff? What have you got plans to score anymore? And I think we—I I know the answer, but <laughs> tell everybody what they can look forward to um, um, with your releasing with within our gates. Well, yeah, within our gates is another Oscar me show film that was kind of, and Prof Muster can can um, clarify this, but it was kind of his answer. You know, all the readings um, that I read to. D.W. Griffith's Birth of a Nation, which depicted, you know, African Americans as, you know, you know, less than human. I can come up with a bunch of different adjectives, but um, I, when I got called to do that, um, I, I heard of the film, but I hadn't watched it. Then someone gave it to me. I was like, whoa, <laughs> yo, what's this? And then I really, I was like, and, and I'm, I'm very. I'm I'm very and I was happy that I was given the opportunity to do those who filmed. I mean, they're great, but it depicted information. I'm I'm pretty sure Prof Musser is very uh, well and astute about the content of the film, but it creates and we I I feel I owe it to the audience for us to have a dialogue, a, a pre-film. You're gonna see some things, and this is, you know, you this is before they had ratings for film, but the things that we we may want to talk about that deal that has carried over and is relative today with race relations and and um, you know our our community uh, like like 
Prof. Marshall said, um, the other thing I wanted to add was that Michelle couldn't show those films. I think what we had was eight of the original nine reels, and when he showed them publicly at first, he could only show five because of the content um, a, pr a preacher, a man of the cloth, drinking, womanizing. Of course, that doesn't happen, right? <laughs> so um, anyway, but I'm sorry to give, to give a long answer. I did want to say that, but when he'd go into the African-American theaters, we, they would get to see the whole film, all nine. I don't know what was on the ninth reel, but yes, I love doing it. I don't know if I'll be the silent film guy, but getting a chance to get inside those characters and tell those stories and make the music um, speak. Whenever we performed it, if the peop if the, we're behind the screen and we're doing um, back pro projection, um, folks have often said that once they start watching the film, they forgot that there were live musicians actually playing because, um, and I, I, I love it, but yeah. it brings about much needed conversation. So that's it. I think that's perfect. And that is just what we, we as a silent film festival are always looking for with our, the music with, with the, with the film. And we really appreciate how you've achieved that. Um, I've got to wind up. There is a question hanging uh, and it's actually, I'm going to just flag it up because it's from John Sweeney, who's another one of our festival musicians who um, says what a wonderful, wonderful score it was. And he asks about how you managed it basically to make it cohere. Um, but I should say at this point, we've run out of time. So I'm glad to tell everybody that Professor Charles Musser and Wycliffe Gordon have both agreed to hop over to the, um, to the Facebook HipFest hub. And so if there's any more questions that you've got, that they're going to be in the, you might give them a few minutes to recover themselves. And then you can maybe put your questions um, in text, you know, written form and Wycliffe and Charles will try to respond to those um and i want to say so wycliffe's score is going to be released later this year for within our gates and um charles musser is always producing new work um he had a film at uh Port was it last two years ago at Port and you had a film charles didn't you and but and a book is in the work so watch watch out for that um also in the film in the hub afterwards we've got a playlist uh, on Spotify there's a link there that you can listen to and that playlist was curated by Wycliffe so we can all carry on the party there and I finally want to say please join us tomorrow and um, we're going to be starting off with our behind the scenes tour of the Hippodrome and um, a talk on Scottish cinema and the flu pandemic of 1918. And then in the evening, we've got Grass, a wonderful documentary um, with a wonderful accompaniment from Mike Nolan. So I think that is us out of time. And I just want to say thank you all so much for joining us for our first attempt. So I hope that my, when my dog went a bit bonkers in the background there. I'm <laughs> sorry about that earlier. And um, lovely to have you, Professor Charles Massa and Wycliffe Gordon. Thank you. Thank you. I'll see you at the party. See you at the party. Yeah. <laughs>